yard until it's clutched. They'll have to throw it up. Garher, turn around, shot in the air. Oh, it's good. It's tied again. I, I don't believe it. We've got a third overtime in a Boston game. Two seconds. One second. West throws it up. He makes it. West throws it up and makes it. Jerry West made it from the other side of the midcourt strike. Greer's putting the ball on a play. He gets it out deep, and Havlicek steals it over the stand, Jones. Havlicek stole the ball. It's all over. It's all over. Johnny Havlicek is being mobbed by the fans. Johnny Havlicek stole the ball. Excitement and great plays have always been part of the NBA playoffs. Perhaps it's the heightened competition. Perhaps it's a sense for drama. Playoff time seems to offer a special invitation for basketball's most extraordinary moment. This legacy continued in 1985 as heralded rookies gave dazzling performances. While tireless veterans flashed old spark, men of all ages were once again filled with the loftiest of aspirations. Excitement and great plays have always been part of the NBA playoffs. Perhaps it's a heightened competition. Perhaps it's a sense for drama. Playoff time seems to offer a special invitation for basketball's most extraordinary moment. This legacy continued in 1985 as heralded rookies gave dazzling performances. While tireless veterans flashed old sparks, Men of all ages were once again filled with the loftiest of aspirations. For their Western Conference opponents, the Los Angeles Lakers were a universal headache. Having won four of the last five conference titles, the Lakers eyed the Phoenix Suns as their first-round patient, a team whose five injured regulars gave their bench an emergency room gloom. There's no sense in deluding ourselves and thinking that, that uh, there's an even match here. We're, we are a banged-up team. The Lakers' prognosis couldn't be better as they had won the Pacific Division by a record-setting 20-game margin. The decimated Suns were no match for L.A.'s clean bill of health, whose running game put Phoenix on the critical list. The Lakers' bench was particularly impressive, highlighted by the work of Larry Sprague, Bob McAdoo, and Mike McGee. Everything was bouncing L.A.'s way, and it wasn't for the Suns. The series became a personal horror show for Phoenix coach John McLeod. Los Angeles swept the series in three straight games, demolishing the Suns by an average of 20 points per contest. In round two, Los Angeles hoped for a repeat sweep against the Trailblazers. Portland's 357th consecutive sellout saw their team down three games to none partly due to L.A.'s containment of Kiki Vandaway. However, the high-scoring forward got the Blazers rolling in Game 4. The Blazers traded five players to get Vandaway, part of Portland's new look that included number one pick Sam Bowie. Against the Lakers, Bowie converted all the talk of his potential into talk of his performance as he anchored the Blazers' determined transition game. Portland wildly celebrated an eight-point win, but like all festive parties, a spinning hangover usually follows. Portland had to sober up to Magic Johnson, who sliced through the Blazers with razor-sharp perfection. Johnson's fifth-game wizardry earned him a triple-double as he bewildered Portland with his complete bag of tricks. The Blazers were eliminated, and smiles abounded in L.A. By the time the Western Finals reached Game 4 in Denver, the Lakers' smiles were notably restrained. 
Los Angeles held only a 2-1 game advantage, losing by 22 points to the Nuggets, owners of the league's most explosive offense. Behind their volcanic fan, the Nuggets sought a series split, and Alex English gladly took the role of crowd pleaser. The league's third leading point producer unloaded his entire arsenal for 26 first half points. Complimenting English was the inside muscle of Calvin Knapp, who gave Denver a second scoring gun and L.A. a double-barreled headache. However, the Nuggets front line took a hard fall in the second half. English broke his already aggravated thumb while diving after a loose ball. His magic arm was ushered to the sideline, shouldering Calvin Knapp with the Nuggets scoring load. But several plays later, Calvin Knapp took a tumble. His agonizing expression mirrored the Nuggets' painful luck of double injury. But throughout the season, Denver fans and Coach Doug Moe had marveled at Nat's ability to rebound from adversity. When they see him go out and play, and they know that there's a lot of times he shouldn't be playing. They know there's a lot of times he can't even walk, and uh, he goes out and plays. And that's not, you know, you hear that said a lot of times, but this is a definite true case of a guy that pushes himself beyond his limits. And uh, uh, I can't imagine anyone being any tougher than Calvin Nat. With Denver's scoring machine grounded, the Laker Air Corps looked to break the game wide open. Yet L.A.'s stratospheric attack could not outdistance a Denver comeback, paced by Nat's dramatic return. Down to the wire, Denver matched L.A. basket for basket, although the Lakers would not relinquish the lead. Denver's tenacity held fast by virtue of two consecutive three-pointers, with Mike Evans tying the score with a minute remaining. Doug Moe sensed L.A.'s imminent fall, and the Nuggets had to stop the Lakers just one more time. Kareem with 30 seconds. Kareem underneath, puts it up, no. Gets it back, puts it up, no. Rebound to Worthy, put it up, five-footer, no. Rebound is off, three ball. Lakers got it. Cooper throws it, no. Tip Worthy, yes. James Worthy's tip-in left the Nuggets numbed in disbelief. One tantalizing basket afforded the Lakers a 3-1 to one game margin and sent the series back to Los Angeles with a chance to wrap things up on their home court. Forum fans almost tasted the Lakers an even more promising notion with Denver's top scorer out of action. Aside from a possible Laker victory, attention was focused upon Magic Johnson, who was on the verge of shattering Jerry West's all-time playoff assist record. Johnson got right down to business by orchestrating the Lakers' fast break from his familiar middle lane. By the middle of the second quarter, Johnson notched his historic moment. Magic Johnson put the Lakers in full control, and the inevitability of playoff elimination weighed heavily upon the Nuggets, particularly for the retiring Dan Issel. Denied an opportunity to an NBA championship, Issel still finished his career with a flourish by netting his final shot for a three-pointer. Issel's perfect ending received a rousing response from the crowd and teammates. In playing his final game in Los Angeles, Issel closed the books on one of the most enduring careers in basketball history. During his career, Dan Issel became one of the few players ever to star at two different positions. His versatility as a center and power forward earned him prestige and an ABA title with the Kentucky Colonels. He moved over to the NBA, where he became the league's smallest bona fide big man. But his gritty determination and long-range accuracy helped him set a 22.6 point average during his 15 years. Issel also had great fan appeal, recognized as the most popular athlete in Colorado. He retires as a basketball legend and the fourth greatest scorer in the annals of the game. The forum's cheers were a perfect salute to an old soldier, but there was a bigger reason to shout. The Lakers' fifth trip to the finals in six years and the most anticipated rematch in team history. Well, no question. You know, we were the favorites, and we made our way. They won the East, we won the West. So it's like uh, everybody just get ready, sit back, and uh, let's enjoy it. You know, this is it, first week of June. And it always happens to be Boston Celtics and L.A. Laker time. The reigning champs awaited the Lakers with a more cynical perspective. If it was a movie, how would you title it? 
<laughs> Return of the nerds. <laughs> Hat, hat, t shirt, t shirt. What can I get you? Lodge? Yo, swing it for the Celtics. Wipe them up, Boston. Sit with the cuckoo man. Best t shirt on Causeway Street. If t shirt sales were any indication, basketball fans were in for a windfall profit during the finals. Pent up rematch excitement could no longer be contained. Bursting forth with Boston fans marketing their opinions is like Jack Nicholson, a new wardrobe. Yet beneath the free game pleasantries was the cold steel pulse of the Celtic diehard. They just didn't sit in the Boston Garden. They manned battle stations, psyching themselves for the opening tip-off. Celtic players were slightly less intense. Guys, yeah, turn around. You know, television. This is what happens when you get to the big boys. The Celtics and Lakers rivalry was the perfect drama for a nationwide audience. Okay, now take four again, John. Uh, let me just see what it would look like without the white light. With the involved plot complications of the Celtic dynasty and the Lakers' revenge, viewers watched in record numbers. So Larry Bird's injury, of course, is number one, but the Celtics will certainly have more problems than the Lakers, and for more on that, let's go back upstairs to Brent. Okay, now take four again, John. So we are set to begin now. It is game one. We are down to the magnificent two. It's the Lakers and the Celtics coming up on CBS. Interest was building. Before the Celtics and Lakers would grind elbows, they had to square off against a different kind of opponent. Pre-game tension. It affects even the most seasoned athletes. For the Lakers, it was a tough battle amidst Boston's zealous supporters. The Celtics had their own case of the warm-up jitters. Their fans were so accustomed to Celtic championships that they practically demanded it. They were ready to chalk up another victory to Boston's illustrious 15-1 finals record. For both sides, pregame tension was inescapable. A world championship, the thunderous din, the superb competition, all beneath the legendary banners of basketball's most hallowed hall. They were the supreme ingredients for the year's most anticipated moment, the rematch of the NBA's best two teams. No team has won back-to-back -back championships since the Bill Russell Celtics, a legacy Larry Bird hoped to revive. Bird was one of five championship MVP winners on hand. Another was Magic Johnson, who vowed to redeem himself from last year's poor showing. But in a series highlighted by star-studded lineups, Game 1 pace setter didn't even appear on the marquee. Danny Ainge, the greenest of the Celtics starters, took over as Boston's floor leader. Last year, Ainge watched his predecessor, Gerald Henderson, riddle the Lakers with timely outside shooting. Now it was his turn to be dead solid perfect. Ainge's 15 first quarter points boosted the Celtics to a comfortable and seemingly effortless lead. Ainge has always enjoyed a fine reputation as a streak shooter, but rarely in a game of this magnitude. His performance was convincing and slightly unexpected. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's was simply unexpected. As the Lakers customarily do during an opposition's hot streak, they turn to Kareem to provide stability. But Kareem was wobbly at best. Robert Parrish threw Kareem's low post offense completely off balance. It was remarkably reminiscent of Game 1 in the Philadelphia series when Parrish dominated Moses Malone. Kareem's game looked flat, and his hustle was closer to a four-tire blowout. The Lakers were taught a first-half lesson in humility, led by Parrish's mastery over Kareem. The future Hall of Famer turned in his worst game as a playoff performer, enabling Boston to establish a championship record of 79 first-half points. And if that wasn't enough, the Celtics were thirsting for more. Casey Jones wanted to keep his team sharp. He inserted Scott Wedman, who promptly took over where Ainge left off. The sharpshooting swingman connected on all 11 of his field goal attempts, including an incredible four-for-four four tally from three-point range. Wedman exemplified Boston's day of perfection. 
For all the glorious game played in Celtic history, Boston had never enjoyed a game quite like this. The Celtics 148 to 114 win marked the greatest margin of victory ever in an NBA Finals contest. Celtic delirium captivated the garden. Even loyal Laker fans had to acknowledge this awesome display of basketball might. But the Lakers themselves were not ready to throw in the towel. They would have to come back from a Memorial Day Massey Jones knew it best. This was a, this was a whipping, and uh, they're going to come smoking and burning, and this is going to be a motivating point for them uh, for the next ball game. Uh, so come Thursday, we know uh, we are in deep trouble, and we have to come out and try to uh, match the intensity that they're going to come out with. Uh, they were going on all cylinders, and they were primed and ready for the first home game, and they deserve a lot of credit. We'll be back, you know. If uh, seven game series can be decided in one game, then it would be over with, but there's going to be six more basketball games. The speculation surrounding Game 2 was akin to the opening bell on Wall Street. Momentum and strategy were the watchwords that fueled conversation while bearish sentiment sided with the Lakers. Pat Riley levied much of his first game criticism on Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the man who had to inspire the Lakers after the most embarrassing loss in team history. In turn, the 38-year-old veteran publicly vowed to vindicate himself. As far as the Celtics were concerned, Kareem's resolve wasn't even an issue. Boston hadn't yet lost a home playoff game. After the Lakers' pathetic showing, nothing seemed likely to change. With three more home games scheduled in the Garden, a victory parade appeared to be a lot. Instead, Boston marked time to a procession of poor perimeter shooting. The jump shots that dropped faithfully three days earlier betrayed the Celtics, leaving them prey to the Lakers' transition game. The Celtics' marksmanship had considerably cooled. Even when Boston went inside, they missed. Again, throwing the Lakers' fast break into high gear. Basketball's version of the fast-paced L.A. freeway system. Boston got a rear window perspective of the Lakers' drive to a first quarter lead. Much of the credit went to Pat Riley, who switched the defensive assignments of Magic Johnson and Byron Scott. The taller Johnson intimidated Danny Ainge's shooting, while Scott's quick hand had a field day on the Celtics' backcourt. Yes. The Lakers were overwhelmingly quicker and sharper than the Celtics. And surprisingly, they were more physical as well. Los Angeles adopted a swashbuckling style to break up passes and dive after loose balls, sacrificing their own bodies. The Lakers took any risk to disrupt Boston's game. It was ironic. A year ago, the Celtics were the aggressors. Now, Los Angeles had dramatically turned the table. However, no role reversal was more illuminating than that of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who returned to the basic elements of his game, the skyhook and the lurking defense. No longer resembled that aging man witnessed in game one, but a spry rookie eager to impress. Among the swashbuckling Lakers, Kareem was the Pirate King, who powered his way to 30 points, 17 rebounds, and three blocked shots. The Laker captain was again at the top of his game, building L.A.'s lead to as many as 18, while Boston floundered in his wake. The Celtics buoyed themselves with a modest rally near the end of the third quarter, but still remained the tormented victims of the bullying Lakers. With the Celtics needing to make up a dozen points in a dozen minutes, Boston now knew it was time to go to war. Make the run now, defense! Well, the defense did it! Oh, DJ with the ball. Boston is trailing by 12. Now to Bird. Bird on a pop-out. Fires it in. The troops rallied behind Larry Bird, the Celtic floor general, who holds the sterling reputation as basketball's best clutch performer. The Celtics edged closer behind Bird's five fourth quarter baskets and uncanny team play. Back over to Bird. Bird up fakes on the three point. 
three-pointer goes into the lane, back over to Robert. Robert gets it, Robert lays it up and in, and he went foul. He went... Bird and company were beginning to warm up, and the Lakers were feeling the heat. Outscored by a 15-6 clip and the lead cut to four, the Lakers had to show their poise, desperately in need of a basket. The Lakers looked to Kareem, but the Celtics did too. Now, Magic Johnson devised a plan of his own. The Lakers' lead grew to six, and the Celtics tried to fight back once again. Unfortunately, Kevin McHale forgot about L.A.'s begoggled wonder. Kareem's block diffused the Celtics' power game, and Michael Cooper's top of the key jumper finally pulled the plug. Cooper's shot just beat the 24-second clock, leaving Boston too little time to mount another charge. Boston had fought back gamely, refusing to yield to L.A.'s strongman tactics, but wound up on the short end of a 109-102 score. The Lakers walked away with what they wanted, a split in Boston and a restoration of their character. The Lakers proved they could rebound from adversity, and the Laker captain did it with a personal return to glory. I know he constantly is scrutinized for uh, whatever his deficiencies may be, but if you watched him tonight play with tremendous passion and lead us Got every big rebound, played about 40 minutes, uh, made the big shots. Uh, he's exactly what he's all about. And uh, without him tonight, we're, we're an average team. We're an average team anyhow without him. But he's, uh, he's just a great player and did a great job. Well, it feels good, you know, to know that you're not dead. You know, they had people throwing dirt on my face. It's good to know that uh, that was a little premature. The sweet smell of success escorted Kareem and the Lakers back to the coast. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're delighted to have you with us today on our flight to Los Angeles, along with our world The champion, Celtics Boston had to Celtics. cope with their Game 2 Blues at 30,000 feet, a difficult environment for six, nine bodies just looking for room to relax. But the closed quarters did have a bright side, a chance to become intimate with their loyal followers, and it was an opportunity Cedric Maxwell couldn't pass up. Hey, you guys out to the round. To the round man. Say hello, America. Hello. Hello, America. Hello, America. There you go. All right. What Maxwell didn't prepare his new friends for were all the funny things one sees on the way to the forum. We all to see the fakers. <laughs> <laughs> to Boston's beloved Celtics, Los Angeles is a funny, exotic city of attitude. Whether it be a strut looking for glitter, to a laid-back stroll near the surf, L.A. is a place of pleasure-seeking harmony, in tune with the Southern California sun. And in some parts of the city, attitudes perceive championship basketball as an aberration of the good life. What sporting event is going on today? I don't know. I do exercise in aerobics. I have an international gourmet fudge company. Who has time for sporting events when you are professional people and just steal a day to go shop? The Lakers, isn't it? It is, right? It's hard. Like the devotees of Rodeo Drive, forum fans dieted on the very best. But even the best sometimes have imperfections, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was ready to correct one of them. Like the other legendary Lakers, Kareem shared a bridesmaid syndrome of never beating the Celtics in the final. A notorious distinction to be corrected before his own number becomes a retired forum fixture. In the early going of Game 3, Kareem demonstrated flawless offensive execution and a swarming defense. Kareem's heightened search for excellence marked a continuation of the Lakers' revival sending Boston immediately to the board. To soften Kareem's dominant play, Boston fought to regain control of the glass. Their charge was led by Kevin McHale. Like John Havlicek, McHale went from a sixth man to a superb starter. He's catapulted his stardom by way of a long, strong reach and an almost unblockable jump shot. His height and mobility make him a problem for centers and forwards. 
McHale toiled for 16 points in the game's first 16 minutes. And frankly, the Lakers didn't have a clue how to stop him. The same couldn't be said of Larry Bird, who was consumed by James Worthy's hounding defense. Bird's inaccuracy was the main culprit behind Boston's dwindling 10-point lead, and it gave Magic Johnson a backdoor way to solve the McHale mystery. The Lakers coolly moved back into contention by allowing anyone but McHale to challenge their sagging defense. Byron Scott's monstrous breakaway jam put L.A. solidly into the lead. Los Angeles' late first half burst sent them into the locker room with a 65-59 to 59 advantage and giving the Laker crowd basketball's taste for the good luck. The third quarter was a variation on a theme as the Lakers' showtime offense kept the good times rolling. The Lakers exploited their most enviable trait, speed, exploding past the Celtics time and time again. Speed has always been a Lakers trademark, but it has stereotyped them as a one-dimensional team and Pat Riley as a single-issue coach. They just have this perception that we are a footloose and fancy free team that runs a fast break. And it's, you don't get here four years in a row if you don't act aggressively, period. This year, the Lakers had composed a new tune for title redemption, a weary physical waltz. Kevin McHale got the worst of it in the late stages of game three. It would be a theme that would haunt the Celtics throughout the series. The bruising pace took its toll, sapping strength and vitality out of everyone on the court. It even took its toll on a tense Jerry West, awaiting the precise moment when Kareem would snap his all-time playoff scoring record. The crowd reacted with a tumultuous response as Kareem had added yet another crowning achievement. He gratefully acknowledged the tribute, but was more attuned to the Lakers' 136-111 victory a second win that put L.A. halfway to their season-long quest. Boston's haggard starters looked on, chagrined that their opening game laugher was now a humorous memory for the Lakers. Boston got an education, learning that the science of muscle and brawn was an indisputable element to the Lakers' chemistry. By game four, simple mathematics became another important subject, for a third Lakers win would create a highly imbalanced equation. Boston turned to the game tapes as a tool to study the Lakers' strengths, to digest tendencies, to look for an edge, any edge, that could tie up the series. If the videotape could provide one, the Celtics waited anxiously for that slow dissolve into game action. From the opening tap, game four shaped up as a classic struggle. Larry Bird's shooting eye returned, while the Lakers' fast break remained in peak form. The score in action was close and lively as both teams squelched their physical play for a finesse style. The Celtics' strategy was to hone in on Kareem, forcing him to exit early with two personal fouls. Boston's videotape classroom revealed L.A.'s reduced mobility whenever the hobbled Mitch Kupchak replaced Abdul-Jabbar. But Mitch Kupchak has never been a stranger to challenges. Kupchak had gained a reputation as a sixth man for the Washington Bullets, contributing heavily to the team's 1978 championship drive. His strong inside play moved to Los Angeles, but in his 34th game as a Laker, Kupchak suffered a severe knee injury. 
Kupchak was determined to return, but doctors feared irreparable damage. Teammates like Kurt Rambis questioned Kupchak's comeback chances. Practically everybody except himself counted Mitch out. And in fact, that, that probably worked in a positive fashion for Mitch because he said, I'm going to prove everybody wrong. I'm going to come back and, and not only play, but I'm going to play well. You know, when I got injured my first year, you know, I, was there, I sat back and watched the next four years um, the Lakers go to the finals, and I could not contribute. And when I was able to come back, uh, it acted like a motivating factor. So I knew all I had to do was get back, and I'd be in the finals. Kupchak had arisen from the NBA ashes. His hustle and determination kept Los Angeles close, while Dennis Johnson kept Boston close, with sheer cunning, driving the lane whenever Bird or McHale were double teamed. He lured the taller Laker guards to challenge his all-NBA defensive skill. He camouflaged his reckless gambling style to force numerous Laker turnovers. He was the sly fox hunting L.A.'s thoroughbreds, keeping Boston neck and neck by halftime. The forum's flashy floor show mirrored the action, appealing and in step. Superb entertainment for those who entertain. Yet beneath the talk show smiles was the disturbing memory of last year's identical scenario and that pivotal Game 4 loss. But in L.A., sequels are meant to be left on the soundstage. The one technique the Lakers may have borrowed from movie land was special effects. The Lakers' third quarter defense appeared to be porous and susceptible as they backed away from the Celtics' passing lane. But it was an illusion as L.A. snared Celtic passes and bombarded them with unchallenged layups. Boston knew this was no gimmickry as the Lakers streaked to a 14-point swing. The Celtic regulars were being overwhelmed and Casey Jones was desperate. Jones rotated four subs into the lineup, hoping they could slow the Lakers. Boston's second unit did that and more, as Greg Kite bottled up the middle and Quinn Buckner hit a critical 20-footer. The Lakers, as Boston's second string brought the Celtics to within a basket by the start of the fourth quarter. It was now time for the refreshing Celtics starters to resume their duties, led by that fourth-quarter maven, Larry Bird. I like to play a strong fourth quarter. If I play a strong fourth quarter and we're close, I feel that we're going to win the game. Um, if I'm getting mile side shots and, and I'm moving on the offensive end, uh, it seems like the defense sort of watches me more than any other player that we have. Bird had already showed his fourth quarter prowess in game two. In game four, he was an outright tour de force, gobbling up and throwing down anything he could get his hands on. Bird single-handedly catapulted Boston into the lead to increase L.A.'s recurring paranoia. But the Lakers refused to crack as a Magic Johnson steal forged L.A. back on top with 2.45 remaining. Emotions were swept up by the ebb and tide of lead changes. The Lakers keyed on Larry Bird down the stretch, allowing others like Danny Ainge to carry the burden. Ainge's second straight jumper put Boston up by two with 33 seconds remaining. Now the Lakers would have to respond. Fortunately, they had a little magic up their sleeve. Magic's got it, takes it over to Scotty. Scotty in low to Kareem. Swing left, shoot right, a 15 footer in and out. No. Rebound is off. Put up and in. Magic Johnson's tying basket sent the forum into pandemonium as Laker fans envisioned, at the very worst, an overtime. Containing Bird and Ainge appeared to be the solution to keep the score tied at 105 all. But with 19 ticks left on the scoreboard, the world champions had the time and a notion how to bring down an early curtain on Showtime. All uh, right now, they have a double stack, and Larry walks through the lane, coming to the right. And he gets the pass. Goes into the lane, jump pass back out to DJ, DJ throws, oh, the cop! It's gone! And no time left! It's all over! It is all over! Boston wins the all in fourth, fourth game! The 107-105 triumph not only tied up the series, but also guaranteed Boston another game at home. The victorious Celtics would have earned rave reviews in variety. Their Hollywood finish showcased a colorful cast, an exciting plot, and even a soundtrack. We hate the LA Lakers. We make technical sins a fool. We hate the LA Lakers. And we know the South will be censored. Hey! Hey!
Boston's Back Bay braggadocio was worlds apart from Los Angeles's Elan. Stylish Laker fans approach a home game with a sense of fashion, savoring it as if it were a prize-winning Beaujolais instead of a discount brew. However, Laker general manager Jerry West would have gladly settled for barroom rowdiness if it could bring home a championship. West had seen many Laker teams dry up against Boston, and he hoped Coach Pat Riley could lead L.A. to their coveted oasis. But all the pressure was on the Lakers themselves. They needed a victory and gave birth the necessity of winning two games at the ominous Boston Garden. It would be a critical game with both teams suffering handicaps. The Lakers were without forward Jamal Wilkes, while Boston was saddled with a subpar Cedric Maxwell, last year's seventh game hero. For storylines past and present, the final game in Los Angeles had to be the Lakers. L.A. knew that no one man could dominate play, that winning depended on the solidarity of a cohesive unit. The mixture of great talent has always been the foundation of the Lakers' success. But winning in the clutch takes more than that. These superb parts had to mesh as one perfect machine. Like all machines, the Lakers needed a pump to get them going. That responsibility belonged to Kurt Rambis, a human battering ram, Pat Riley's catalyst. I've always felt that players like Kurt, that might not be blessed with all the natural abilities, uh, but uh, as Bill Russell once said, he's always felt that that hustle was the extreme talent, and that's what Kurt gives us. In many ways, Kurt Rambis is a Rambo in high tops, an unheralded star willing to sacrifice himself for the cause. Like the screen hero, the Celtics always knew he was coming to get him. Rambis's efforts gave Boston plenty of headaches. Teammate James Worthy made them go bleary-eyed. Every time the Celtics looked around, there was James Worthy ready to fill the hoop with thunder. Like Kevin McHale, it had taken a few years for Worthy to gain superstar status. He has redefined the power forward position by blending a strong, wiry frame with explosive speed. Worthy proved to be too much too often for the Celtics as he coasted to 19 first half points. The Lakers' front line paced Los Angeles to a 64-51 halftime lead. And in the third period, everything was going the Lakers' way. Boston couldn't get a break, and matters were compounded when a technical was called on Casey Jones. Jones walked onto the court to dispute the call with referee Darrell Garrison. His protest incited a second technical and a game ejection leaving Boston 17 points in the hole and without their head coach. The genius of Red Auerbach may have been behind Jones's stormy exit, a tactic Auerbach often used to fire up his squad. It was an old trick for new dogs as the Celtics started a long march back into contention. Kareem had great success with 26 points in three periods. But in the final phase, his teammates looked to him too often, rendering Kareem helpless to Boston's collapsing defense. The entire Laker machine was beginning to stall, a dangerous omen whenever Larry Bird begins to pour it on. Boston trimmed the Lakers' lead to 12, 10, 8 points as the Celtics' footsteps were getting a bit too loud for the Lakers. Pat Riley had seen enough as Boston pulled to within four points. It was time for an overhaul, and Riley reminded his men of the urgency to win at home, a goal only accessible by total team play. The Lakers made their adjustments, with Kareem kicking the ball out to open teammates. The Lakers were again turbocharged, and it was Magic Johnson who kicked it into high gear. Johnson wound up with 26 picture-perfect points and 17 assists, making more amends for last year's tough sledding. Four points were as close as Boston would get, and their hopes were finally extinguished when the Laker trio of Johnson, Worthy, and Abdul-Jabbar topped off their 95-point combined effort. There were no buzzer beaters, no green and white euphoria, as the Lakers turned back the Celtics' determined challenge. Their 120 to 111 win put Los Angeles just one step away from the team's season-long quest.
Sharing habits. Parting L.A., the Lakers still had a big task to pull out one of two games at the Boston Garden. Talk on the street made that seem unlikely. We'll give you a prediction. We'll give you today's game to the Celtics and the seventh game to the Celtics, too. When does L.A. beat them? Eight in a row. There are certain things in sports you never go against, and one of them is the Boston Celtics and Boston Garden. It's all because of the parquet, nothing else. The Celtic myth translated clearly in any language. The Celtics are the number one. And a very pleasant good afternoon to you, ladies and gentlemen, from the Boston Garden, where the Los Angeles Lakers hope to achieve something they have never done. The Los Angeles Lakers, by winning two of three at home in the new format of the NBA, have achieved a three to two advantage. They want to stifle the Celtics here today and be crowned the 1985 world champions. The NBA title is on the line at Boston Garden. I'm Chick Hearn, and we hope that you will enjoy it. Despite having a win in hand, the Lakers were underdogs. Boston's unfriendly parquet was a graveyard to every team that tried to wrestle a championship from the home court Celtics, and fans looked forward to another death walk. The ghosts of Celtics past failed to rattle Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who looked to take the title torch away from another number 33, Larry Bird. But Boston looked exceptionally loose, even nonchalant, knowing they still had breath in their championship lives. But in the opening minutes, an airtight rim sent Boston scurrying for the oxygen mask. The Celtics kept missing easy chip-ins, and the Laker guards took advantage. Byron Scott shot BBs from the outside, while Magic Johnson lined up his howitzer. Both benches realized the importance of establishing tempo, which from Pat Riley's view looked pretty good. But occasionally, the Celtics stumbled across a lucky clover, finding the Lakers out of position. Boston had reason to cheer. Their offense was playing poorly, but the Celtics remained close. Yet there was no explanation why they were missing the easiest of plays. Robert Parrish's botched layup was doubly fatal, as the Celtics center brooded down court, while Kareem took advantage of smaller opponents. There were moments when the Lakers were as sharp as the crease on Pat Riley's new suit. But this scattered brilliance produced a disappointing result. A tied halftime score against a weakened opponent. Oddly, the Lakers were their own worst enemy by shooting just 60% from the foul line while being out-rebounded by nine. The Lakers' halftime revision was a simple one. Get the ball to Kareem, who delivered just 12 seconds into the third period. The Lakers began playing with a higher level of intensity, most apparent with Magic Johnson, who was still avenging last year's final game. Los Angeles moved out to a 10-point lead, and Riley screamed to maintain the winning edge. The Lakers kept pouring it on, and in turn, the Celtics kept spilling their guts. The leprechaun charm of the Boston Garden now seemed as thin as the Celtic hands were heavy. Yet Boston remained within striking distance, and Larry Bird sought to keep the Celtic mystique alive. As they had done throughout the series, Boston mounted another fourth period comeback. Bird's efforts were accompanied by Kevin McHale, who used up all his fouls before nodding out with a 32-point, 16-rebound day. Laker hearts were sinking as Boston showed a reservoir of confidence. The world champions were backing the Lakers into a corner with enough momentum to carry them to a seventh game. Los Angeles badly needed to regroup. Overhead, the championship banners of Russell, Kuzi, and Havlicek recited a silent incantation, reminding the Lakers that no one takes away the title when it's played on the parquet. But with the championship within reach, Kareem and the Lakers turned a deaf ear in refrain. Behind Kareem, the Lakers engineered a final scoring burst to put Boston's series dreams to rest. The Celtics watched in quiet sorrow as the Lakers neared their championship. Kevin McHale looked on helplessly 
as Kareem solidified his claim as the series' most valuable player. It was observed that only a true team of destiny would destroy the Celtic jinx and win the title in Boston. The 1984-85 Los Angeles Lakers were just that. With time elapsing, Boston saw its season fading, and fittingly, Kareem turned out the light. The Los Angeles Lakers had finally achieved their impossible dream. After eight disappointments, the Lakers could finally hold their heads victorious over the Celtics. They did it in six games, and of all places, in Boston Garden. The losing Celtics watched with exasperation, reliving the wonderful moment that was theirs just a year ago. It was the greatest of the Lakers' nine NBA championships. For Wilt, Elgin, Jerry, and everyone who wore a purple and gold uniform, this was a fulfillment of a promise and a return to glory.